open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Sorry, Matthew chapter 22. I allowed myself one mistake, and I guess that's my one. Matthew chapter 22. We're doing, looking at verses 35 through 40. Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40. It reads, And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him, saying, Teacher, which is, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. This morning, I want us to focus on the second commandment that we just read there. I want us to spend some time understanding conceptually what it means, uh, to fully understand uh, the principle behind it, what makes it up. I also want us to spend some time understanding how we apply it, right? How do we make it actionable? Um, how do we pull it off the pages and implement it into our lives? There's a couple observations and a couple points I want us to look at as we look at this second commandment. Uh, first, as we just read, the question that was posed to Jesus was, what is the greatest commandment? The lawyer here, the Pharisee, he did not say, what are the first two greatest commandments? He asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered him, and we, we just read it. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So this is the first and greatest commandment. And then Jesus added on to it. He extended his answer, and he said, the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And we think about, why did our Lord answer the question in that way? Our Lord is a masterful teacher. Um, he was able to express things in a simple way, heavenly things, eternal things, in a way that were simple, that were understandable to all men. And so he answers the Pharisee's question, uh, but it adds on to his question. And we think, why did he answer it in such a way? Why did he add that second part? And, and, and the first thing I want us to take away from this is that those two commandments, those two answers are inseparable. His answer would not have been complete had he just given the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. That a complete answer, as Jesus gave it, includes that second commandment. The first and the second are inseparable. You cannot love the Lord your God the way you're commanded to without loving your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor as yourself without loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And so we actually didn't add on to the answer. He gave a complete answer. He gave the first two commandments. They're inseparable. That's the first thing I want us to keep in mind. The second point I want us to, to look at in this is that whenever we encounter that word love, we as, as good Bible students, we know that the English language falls short in describing the word love. We have one word for the word love. The same word is used for love of a hamburger as love for our spouse. It's almost humorous, right? Our language falls short in that. The Greek does much better. It has multiple words for the word love. And so whenever we come across that word love in the New Testament, we always want to go back to the Greek, to the original Greek language, and see what word is used there. Because conceptually, it conveys different things. There can be different ideas beside, behind the word that is given there. The word that's used in this particular scripture is the verb agapeo, A-G-A-P-A-O. It is the verb form of the noun agape. We're familiar with the term of agape love, and this is the verb form of that word. It's an action item. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's something that you do. And so when we look at the definition of that, when we look at uh, the context that it's used in in other parts of the scriptures, uh, when we look at the original Greek language, we see that the way that that word is described is that it's an act of will. It's an act of will. And what that means, it means it's that it's not an emotion. Um, it's not a mindset. It's not something you feel. It's almost something that might be unnatural to you. It's something that you have to think about. It's something that you have to be purposeful with. It's an act of will, something that you're conscientious of. Treating others as ourselves and putting others before ourselves isn't something that's natural to us. We always have ourselves on our mind, right? We're always first in our own mind. We're always thinking of ourselves. That's natural. And this term, this agapeo, this act of will is counter to our nature. It's something we have to put effort into. 
The third point I want us to take away from, uh, from this first part of the scripture is that it is not the term phileo. There is a, a Greek word for love that is phileo, which is, um, which is a, uh, a neighborly affection. That term may make sense when you first read this because you're talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. You might think that it's using that term phileo, again, which is a neighborly affection, which is um, the relationship we might have with our, our actual neighbors in our neighborhood to where we kind of know them, we're nice to them, we, we, we give cordial greetings. That's not the term that's used here. It is the agapeo love. And so with those concepts in mind, uh, we begin to understand what Jesus is saying here with love your neighbor as yourself. We think of this term, this agapeo, this act of will, that it's something that doesn't come naturally to us, that it's, it's not an emotion, um, it's not a mental ascent, um, it's something that we have to do. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. And we start to think about, okay, we understand this concept, but how do we apply it? When we say, okay, we love our neighbor, and we understand the concept of this agapeo love, this verb in the Greek, that it's an act of will, how do we, how do we materialize that? How does that come into be? Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 21. Here Jesus is talking about uh, false prophets that may, that may come, uh, but it has an application to us here as well. It says, You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. If you were to walk up to a tree, uh, we have lots of apple trees around here, and you were to look up in the branches and you see hundreds of red apples hanging from the branches. Maybe they're on the ground from where they've fallen. And then you look down at the trunk, and there's a sign that's been nailed to this tree that says, pear tree. Which one are you going to believe? What is your, going to be your conclusion? Are you going to believe the label that it wears? Or are you going to look at the fruit that it bears? Are you going to look at what's produced? Are you going to see with your eyes what it, the nature of the tree is? Or are you going to believe the label? Jesus says you will know people by the fruit that they produce. And what does he say at the tail end of this scripture? It says, not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father that is in heaven. The one who does the will of my Father. Not the one who reads about the will of my Father. Not the one who believes in my Father. Not the one who talks about my Father. But the one who does the will of my Father. And we see that concept with the fruit tie in here. As we turn over to James chapter 1, verse 22, you guys know this one because we've got it on our sign right now. James 1, 22. It says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, who deceive themselves. To be doers of the word. If we leave the scripture within the pages, we render the Bible a dead book. We know it's not a dead book. We know it's the living word of God. But if all we do is read it, we can even understand it. We can memorize this book cover to cover. But if we don't do it, it doesn't mean anything. James tells us that, not only in chapter 1, but as we turn over to James chapter 2. He goes on in verse 19. And um, John mentioned this scripture in his lesson this morning. Um, if you weren't here for Bible class, you missed out. You should have been here. John did a great job. It says, James chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith, apart from works, is useless? You can see, we can have the faith. We can understand who God is. Even the demons do that. We can know the book. We can do everything to be informed as to what the Word says, but until we do it, 
until we live it, until it shows itself through our actions, until our fruit is seen, then we're not fulfilling that second commandment. We're not fulfilling that concept of that agapeo love that we're to have for our neighbor. And so, as we look for a way to describe this, we realize that love can only be known by the action that it prompts. Did you hear that? Love can only be known by the action that it prompts. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to Peter and he was asking Peter, he said, do you love me? Peter said, of course I love you, Lord. What did he tell him to do? He said, feed my sheep. He asked him three times, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, of course I love you. And what did Jesus tell him to do? He said, go out and do something. It's not enough to say it. You have to do it. Love can only be known by the action that it prompts. Maybe you've been in an argument with your spouse or you've seen somebody argue and you say, well, you know, you've heard, you've heard girlfriends and boyfriends, you know I love you. Yeah, I love you. The other one might say, well, show me, right? A gift, an action, a kind gesture is much more powerful than the words. Love is not something that's spoken. Love is not something that's thought of. This agapeo love is something that's shown. And the only way we can fulfill that commandment, and oh yes, it's a commandment, is to do something about it. And so when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, it's not just this mental agreement that, yeah, we love them. Or we might even say, yeah, we love them. That's not it. It's doing something about it. And so then we think, okay, how can we summarize this? We just, we, we just blazed through a bunch of different concepts, right? We thought about these action items and what this, what this term means and, and how it fits in. And so how do we simply summarize this? What is even just a single word that can summarize this concept and uh, what we just read in James chapter 1 and James chapter 2 and Matthew? The single word is servanthood. That's what I want to talk about this morning. It's servanthood. It's the single term which, in one word, encompasses the things we just talked about for the last five minutes, ten minutes. It's servanthood. Servanthood doesn't come naturally to us, does it? Servanthood, again, is, is similar to the concept of this love your neighbor as yourself, to put others first. Servanthood is counter to our nature. Servanthood is the single most trait which genuinely reflects Christ. You can see that somebody who is a mature Christian who's achieved and lives this servanthood, you can see Christ living in them more than any other trait, more than Bible knowledge, more than uh, any other thing that we can do. If they really have the characteristic of servanthood, it's very easy to see Christ in that person. Servanthood was a key characteristic of our Lord, was it not? Let's turn our Bibles over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. This is Paul speaking to the Philippian church, writing to the Philippian church here. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, among yourselves, now listen, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so as we try to materialize this concept, we see Paul say it here. He said, Christ took the form of a servant, the king of kings, the one whose by hand this world came into being, the one who can save us in heaven. He became a servant. It says he emptied himself on the cross. He humbled himself. He became in human form. If there's one word to describe Christ, it's servanthood. He gave himself over to the will of the Father. He didn't exalt himself even though he has every right to be, he humbled himself for a little while for us. 
At the end here, it says, Paul says that he humbled himself in becoming obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. Let's take a look at that. Turn over to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 41 and 42. You guys know this scripture well. This is prior to Christ, Christ's um, crucifixion. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And here he is, is with his disciples and he withdraws. Verse 41 says, He withdrew from them about a stone's throw when he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Again, this is the Christ. This is Jesus. And he's humbling himself and subjecting himself to the will of the Father. And not for anything that is for him, because he was sinless, but so we can take our sins to the cross, so that we might have opportunity for heaven. It's a characteristic of Jesus. Servanthood is what Jesus embodied during his time on this earth. Turn over to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. It reads, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. We know this story well. We know this account very well that uh, after supper, Jesus gets up and he, he starts washing his disciples' feet. The disciples are confused. and They say, Lord, we should be washing your feet. Yet again, we see the Christ who in Philippians, Paul described as a servant. He takes his followers and he begins to wash their feet. And the interesting thing, if you jump down to verse 15 of this same chapter, what does he tell them? He says, for I've given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. I've given you an example. He didn't have to say that. He lived it already. He had done these things. He had shown himself to be a servant even before this single act of washing his disciples' feet. But he does this final accumulating act of servanthood, and he tells the disciples, I've done this as an example for you so that you might do the same. So now we have the commandment that we read in Matthew. That should be enough. But then also we have the example. That in itself should be enough, but we've got both. We've got the commandment. We've got the example. And so what do we do? How do we make this something that's actionable in our lives? As we talked about in Bible class, as we talked about a little bit in these past few moments. This doesn't mean anything if we leave it on the pages. It has to become something that we do. It has to become part of our lives. This concept of servanthood has to be something that we live. And so what are some avenues that we can apply this concept of servanthood? One of the ways we can do it is that we have to be a servant to strangers. Let's look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And before I read this, you know, again, we think back to this concept of this agapeo love. And, and John read 1 Corinthians 13 for me this morning. That is the characteristics. Those are the perfect, describe, uh, perfect description of this agapeo love. It talks about patience and kindness. These are things that don't come naturally to us. I know patience sticks out for me. I have to work on patience. I am not naturally a patient person. Um, I like to move at a certain speed, and when things don't move that speed, that can be frustrating to me. And that's not anybody's fault but mine. Patience is hard for me. Yet the Bible tells me that that is an attribute of love. And so as I think about this love, this agapeo love, that's something that I'm commanded of. And it fits in perfectly because it's an act of will. It's not something that's natural to me. It's something I have to work on. And so as we think about what John read in 1 Corinthians 13, Let's remember that those are the characteristics of this agapeo love. So here we read in Luke chapter 10, I'll read 25 through 37. You guys know this story well. This is uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. 
It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. Now again, this is a, a separate interaction that Christ had. Um, you'll see the lawyer already knows what Christ had answered previously um, with the first two commandments. And then asks him partway through here, okay, who is my neighbor? As we think about this second commandment. He says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul uh, and with all your, um, sorry, I lost my spot, and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down to Jerusalem from Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest who was going down the road uh, was going down the road when he saw him, and he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these threes do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, You go. And do the same. And so we see this servanthood that this Samaritan displayed. The first two, you guys have heard sermons and lessons about it before. The priest and the Levite, they knew the law. They knew these commandments. They had knowledge. But they didn't make it into anything actionable. They passed by on the other side. Is that fulfilling commandment number two? Even the first commandment? as we know they're inseparable. They knew the law cover to cover. Um, they were faithful Jews well, by all accounts, yet they passed by on the other side. And then we see the Samaritan, and we've been looking on Wednesdays at Bible geography, and we know that back when the kingdom split, the north and the south, that the, the Jews didn't see the Samaritans in the north as equals. They saw them almost as less than human. Yet this Samaritan saw this Jewish man laying on the road, and he had compassion on him. And he fulfilled this second commandment. When we look at what he did for him, uh, we know he put him on his own animal, he took him to an inn, he gave him two denarii. That's about a month's stay at an inn. That would take care of him for about a month. Can you imagine paying for a hotel for somebody you didn't know for a month? And then telling the innkeeper... Whatever you spend in addition to that, I'll come back and I'll repay you. He didn't know this man. It was a stranger. It was someone who might count him as an enemy. And yet he counted him as more important than himself. And he fulfilled this second commandment. We also have to be a servant to our families. We have to be a servant to our families. I'm going to start with the husbands. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for you. I'm going to add on to that because many of the husbands are also fathers, and we'll jump down to uh, the next chapter, Ephesians 6, chapter 4. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the dis discipline and instruction of the Lord. In 525, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What did Christ do? Christ didn't deserve to die. Christ didn't deserve to be crucified. He was blameless. And yet he gave himself up for the sinners, for the church. We are to be the same way to our wives, husbands, that oftentimes it's inconvenient. Oftentimes we come home from work, and the last thing we want to do is to put ourselves second. Can't we just get 10 minutes to sit down by ourselves, right, is the way that we'll think sometimes. That's not the servant attitude. That's not the way that Christ loved the church. So likewise, fathers, bring up your children in obedience to the Lord. Are we serving our children? Are we teaching them the word? Are we taking time away from ourselves to be with our kids, to show them the example that it should be? And again, again as we talked about in class, 
They're going to see what we do and not what we say. They're going to know us by our fruits. And that as we show them this agapeo love, it's something we have to do. It's something that we have to live in order for them to follow after us and to follow our example. Ephesians 5.22, he speaks to the wives here. He says, wives, submit your own husbands as to the Lord. That's not easy for many women, especially of this modern day, to swallow, to submit to your wives. Now, that doesn't mean that you're a slave and uh, you do whatever your husband directs you to do because if your husband is living the way that he should in the scriptures that we just read, and you each have this servant attitude, you should be nothing, uh, your husband should be treating you in such a way as to where uh, submitting to your own husband is something easy to do because he's treating you as Christ would love the church. It's a loving affection. It's, again, fulfilling this second commandment to where uh, you take on this servanthood role and this servanthood attitude. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he finally speaks to the children as we kind of complete the family here. He says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. To obey and to honor, again, that's something we see uh, not very common in children today. To be obedient, to be honorable toward their, to, uh, toward their parents. Again, they want to look after our example. They really do. And children, you are called to be obedient and to honor your father and mother. Again, something that uh, oftentimes isn't easy. And we can remember growing up that that cannot be easy sometimes. That's the commandment we're given, is to put ourselves second. Finally, as we come to the closing moments of our time here, we have to be a servant to the church. We have to be a servant to the church. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. It says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, a God, God arranged all the members in the body, each of them as he, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Bear with me. On the contrary, the parts of the body seem, that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honor, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which uh, our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving it great honor to the part that lacked it. The point that's here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that no matter who we are, no matter how we see ourselves in the church, we each have a role. The body is described here in the various parts, in the eyes, in the ears, in the feet. We each have a role, and each part is important. And if even one part of the body doesn't do its function, doesn't perform in the way that it's called to, the rest of the body feels it. The rest of the body suffers. If you didn't have a nose or eyes or ears, the rest of the parts of your body would have to compensate for that. Even your toes, uh, you stub your toe, it causes your whole body to jump around the room screaming in pain, right? Even the smallest part of the body affects the entire thing. In the same way, even if you perceive yourself to be a small part of the church body, you are vitally important and you have work to do. And each one of us needs to do that work, no matter what it is. Not all of us can do everything. Not all of us can do some things, but all of us can do something. And we're all called to do it. And it's having that servant attitude, looking at the church body, both collectively and as individuals, and holding on to that servant attitude. Understanding that agapeo love, that second commandment that Jesus gives us.
I hope just that in that very brief covering of, of those concepts that we understand that we not only have the commandment and the example to be a servant, that we're called to do these things. It's not an option. It's inseparable from the first commandment of loving our God, that we cannot love our God with all our heart, soul, and strength without loving our neighbors as ourselves, without taking on this servant attitude, without putting ourselves second. We see it as a key characteristic in Christ. We see him give the example for us. We see that love is nothing if it's not actionable, if it's not something that's seen in our lives. And we see the avenues that we have opportunity, among others, to display this servant attitude in our family, to strangers, in the church. I want to go ahead and offer the invitation, but before I do that, I want you to know the invitation is not just this five-minute window after the morning sermon and after the evening sermon. The invitation is always open. Uh, that uh, if you wish to be baptized, that invitation is always yours. The Bible gives that invitation. I don't. And so as we uh, close our Bibles and, and start to take out our songbooks, we'll quickly go through uh, the steps it takes to be added to the church. And again, if you missed John's lesson this morning, you missed a great outline of it. I'll repeat some of the things he said here this morning. First, you have to hear the word, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have to believe, Hebrews eleven six. 6. We looked at Hebrews this morning. We talked about belief. You have to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. You have to confess that Jesus is the Christ. We see that in Romans 10, 9 and 10. And finally, you have to be baptized. We talked a little bit about the root word, baptizo, this morning. <laughs> Baptism is not a translation of the Greek word baptizo. It's a transliteration. If it was a translation, it would be immersed. It would be covered. It's a transliteration of the word baptizo. Baptism means to be covered, to be plunged. We see the commandment of baptism in various scriptures, Acts 2.38, Mark 16.16, 16, 1 Peter 3.21, among others. The latter one there, 1 Peter 3.21, tells them it is baptism that now saves you. Now removal of dirt from the flesh, as Sean would say, it's not a bath, it's not physical, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Baptism is what saves us. And then finally, in Revelation 2.10, we see that we have to walk faithfully that we'll receive a crown of life if we're faithful unto death. I want to extend the invitation this morning that if you have need to become a Christian, you have not been added to the church, you can do that now. Uh, that we're here to serve you, we're here to help study with you, we're here to teach you and to give you that opportunity. If you're already a Christian and you have something weighing on your conscience, uh, something that you need prayers of the church, we can accommodate that as well. Whatever your need might be, please stand as Joe leads us in a song of invitation.